tell me in every way that you did it. And oh, that it pays to serve you. In the matchless, wonderful, magnificent name of Jesus, every glad heart say it in Jesus' name. Thank God. Amen and amen. Before you're seated, just put your arms around one of the brothers that's standing on the right and or the left and tell them the rest of me is the best of me. The rest of me is the best of me. Clap your hands as you're seated in the presence of the Lord. It is with Jesus' joy that I stand here today and I certainly give God great praise for his goodness unto us and to our presiding bishop, Bishop Charles Blake. We certainly praise God for him and the general board and I certainly thank God for the chairman of the board of bishops. It's a humble and honored to have him and these bishops here, our leaders of the church, we're so honored to have them here today and humble. Certainly bless God for the chairman, Bishop Darrell Hines and his executive team and all the priests, all the men of God. We certainly bless you today for your presence. We're going to get right into the word of the Lord. I was so blessed today, and I'm always blessed to be in the presence of the priest. The church that I pastor is 45% male, and it's been a concentrated effort. Thank God for the chairman of AIM, Bishop Sheard, good to see you. It's been a concentrated effort to speak to men because oftentimes when we are preaching, we have the propensity to preach sensual and emotional and it doesn't appeal to the psyche of a man. Uh, men, we are more um, apt to command and direction. So after we've swung from the uh, chandeliers and preached hard and fell out, a man wants to see how you live when the lights go off. And so most men who uh, have any type of commitment to God are not driven as emotionally as women are, and we understand it according to the book of Genesis. The Bible says that he would put enmity between the woman and Satan. Enmity in the Hebrew is eba. It means an irreconcilable hatred. So the woman has an irreconcilable hatred for the devil that men do not have. And so anything that looks like a devil, sounds like a devil, she's ready to rebuke it. And she thinks because we don't have an irreconcilable hatred for the devil that we are somewhat peppered in ignominity. But it's not that we're ignorant, we just don't have that drive that they have. One of the struggles I've had um, lately in the last year or so, uh, I had a chance to go to Israel and listen to the, the priests, the rabbis there in Israel. And I, I realized that they take great insult when we call the Old Testament the Old Testament because to the Jewish mind, it's called the Hebrew Scriptures. And the Orthodox Jew leans towards Genesis to Malachi and has no deference as we do as it relates to Jesus, the Agarazzo, the kinsman redeemer. And while I was there, I watched how they worship. I was on an airline called El Al Airlines, and at 3 o'clock in the morning, one of the rabbis would walk around on the plane and see and make sure all the other rabbis are praying at the appointed hour. And if they weren't praying, they took pictures of those that were not praying who were asleep so they could report them for not praying at the appointed time. There was a young man sitting next to my wife and I, and he was there with his girlfriend. He had to be no, long, no older than 22 or 23. And um, the rabbi went up to him and said, are you Jewish? He said, yes. So the rabbi took off his tefillin, it's the leather wrap that he wraps on his arm to pray, and wrapped up the young man's arm, took off his head phylactery where the commandments are, and put them on his head and said, now pray. And he made the young man pray on the plane in front of his girlfriend. And when he got finished praying, the young man kissed him on the face and said, thank you for reminding me of my mandate. Now, if that had been some of us, <laughs> it would have been more intrusive than a reminder. But then I, I learned that the Western mind, how we think, 
uh, in versus the Eastern mind, the Eastern mind, theologically, they want to defend the truth. The Western mind, we want to argue the truth. Thus that we have denominations and different dogmas and different ideologies as it relates to scripture. And so for the last 10 years, God has been dealing with me with the mind of the believer, the mind of the man. And I'm going to just oppose two scriptures or two areas of scripture, 1 Samuel 28 with Daniel chapters uh, 2, 3, and 4. And uh, we're going to look at this from an objective perspective. Now, I know all of us are not pastors, and I think one of the Frankensteins that we have created is that uh, we have positioned men to uh, believe that their greatness is only going to be in pastoring or preaching. But God has men who are deigned to be anointed, prosperous, successful businessmen, entrepreneurs, doctors, lawyers, in other areas of ministry, in life, market ministry. And sometimes when you see people that are up, there is an assumption that everybody that's up is significant and everybody that's not up is insignificant. And so when we look at promotion sometimes in church, uh, we, we unconsciously have the deacon to believe if he's a good deacon, then he'll be a minister. And if he's a good minister, then he'll be an elder. If he's a good elder, then he'll be a pastor. And we use the positions of the scripture as stepping stones to the next level. But Stephen died a deacon. And what happens, there's, there's more of an affinity to the construct of, of, of ascending positionally and not so much in being who you are. And so what happens now, we contend and we size each other up. The way we talk to each other, we basically ask you the next line that we say after we say, who are you? We say, what do you do? Because we measure ourselves by our productivity. Now, in 1 Samuel chapter uh, 28, 1 Samuel chapter 28, there's a story of a familiar story of a king uh, by the name of Saul. Now, Saul's position is, is unusual because uh, he was re really not um, called of God per se. He is the answer of Israel's prayer because they wanted a king and they wanted to be like other nations. And God had already informed them that if you desire to be like other nations, you're going to have a man over you who can be gifted and flawed at the same time. And so at any rate, they, they got what they asked for and they got this King Saul. Now, it's interesting if we were to back up to the book of Leviticus, you see that there was no oil at the time. There was no oil at the time for a man to be king over Israel. The only oil that existed at the time was the oil for the priest. So in order for you to create what God does not want, you have to use what's left over. And so what they did, they used oil that was not designed specifically for king, but the prophet Samuel used the oil and Saul's anointed to be king. What happens in Saul's life is staggering because you don't see his devotion to God. He has no private devotion. He displays leadership, but he has no private devotion. And it's a bad thing for you to have opportunity, but no private discipline. That when you stand before a people, that all you have is this pseudo statement this is what the scripture means to me that's a dangerous thing because that implies that you're about to put your psyche into the text because we don't know what you ate last night and if you go off your feelings feelings are deceiving so when a man or woman says that this is what the scripture means to me then that's subjective the scripture has to be approached with objectivity it's only one interpretation, but there are applications. And so what happens here, Saul has no private devotion. And we'll pick it up on verse number three. Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah. 
even in his own city, and Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together and they pitched in Geboah. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart was greatly trembling. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not neither by dream, nor by Urim, nor by prophet. Verse 7, Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that has a familiar spirit, that I might go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. And he went and two men with him and they came to the woman by night and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit and bring me him up whom I shall name unto thee. I want to talk to you for the next few fleeting moments about conversations of a lost mind. Conversations of a lost mind. One of the um, theological struggles that we have now is that we have eliminated the, the persona of the human when it relates to his spirituality. What do you mean? It's either God or the devil, but it's never you. And it can't be just God or the devil because you're there somewhere. And there's some things that you do and I do that are not unctioned by God nor influenced by the devil. And so our identity gets lost in trying to accredit everything to the devil that goes bad or we play spiritual Russian roulette and say this was God. That's a dangerous thing because what it causes you to do is to abandon your self-development. There are some things that you and I have to deal with as men. They're, 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 I'm going to say something that you can fix later, bishops. But the devil, according to the scripture, is not omnipresent. If the devil is in Washington, he cannot physically be in Baltimore or, 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 or Buffalo. I, I know, I know, you, I'm going to have to fax an amen from Buffalo, but I, I, I know because see what happens, we have forced our psyche into the text and we put the devil everywhere, but he's not everywhere. He has limitations on where he can be. That's why he has demons, oh God, and devils. So if, if, if the devil is not everywhere, then what's going on? Then why, why am I making some bad decisions? Because we haven't really developed our spiritual intelligentsia. When you look at Galatians, the scripture talks about the works of the flesh. We have prayed over people who had fornication spirits and adultery spirits. But Galatians says these are works of the flesh. And if it's a work of the flesh, it's your obligation to tell your flesh, down boy. But we, we abandon the responsibility. We abandon the responsibility. So we say that, that I got this lust spirit on me. Pray for me. I got this lust spirit for me. Then when you get married, you're looking for that lust spirit. Can you see it? I rebuked it last week. It's a work of the flesh. So watch what happens. The scripture says Saul summed up a familiar spirit 
with the witch from Endor because he didn't have devotion with God. The prophet Samuel is dead. He doesn't have a connection with God. He's not known for talking to God. He doesn't know how to tap into the spirit realm legally. So he goes to the witches whom he had cast out four chapters earlier. Now he's trying to get some help because he's in a position with appointment but no anointing and no sanction because he does not have God's voice speaking in his ear because God's voice Samuel is dead. And he does disguises himself. You know you are psychotic when you call for what you want and you disguise yourself from what you're trying to get just so it can talk to you and not know who you are. So he disguises himself and he goes to the witch of Endor and he says to her, uh, sum up who I need to talk to. Now I know I'm going to swim upstream on this, but your grandmother and your grandfather do not visit you from the dead. Oh, God. I, I, I'm sorry. I, mean, I don't care what he says. My grandfather was talking to me last night. That was not your grandfather. Now, you might be going through some psychosis. You might have memories. But whoever appeared on your side of the bed that looked like your grandmother or your grandfather, it was not them, and quite possibly and quite probably it was a demon. All right. The Bible talks about necromancy, talking to the dead. This woman is a medium. A medium literally is in the middle. Not quite in the spirit, not quite in the flesh, medium. And she's dealing covertly. Saul says, talk, bring up somebody that I need to talk to. And this woman knows that she has made her living faking people out by demons impersonating loved ones. But this time, God did something unusual. Because God wanted to say something to Saul and since you want to deal in dark art, God said, I'm going to peek through dark art and still tell you you're wrong. And while she began to work, the scripture says in, in 1 Samuel 28 that God allowed Samuel to appear. But Saul never saw him. If you read the text, Saul didn't see him. The witch saw him. And the witch practiced what's called prattling, P-R-A-T-T-L-I-N-G. It means to mumble. In other words, when she was talking to Samuel, Saul didn't understand, and all he heard was, blah, 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 blah. he said, what did he say? She said, well, there's somebody here with a mantle and a beard, and, and uh, he said, that's Samuel. Even the witch can talk to the prophet. But you're in such a place of disobedience, you can't even hear from God. But you're the king. It's a dangerous thing to be the king and don't worship. Because if you do not celebrate, you become the celebrity. And it's dangerous when you get an acute case of amnesia and forget it was God's hand on your life that got you into the position that you are. You cannot ever stop worshiping. That is your constraining factor that keeps you balanced. Touch somebody and tell them there's someone greater than you. I don't understand the, 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 the psyche of some men who can't celebrate another man. It doesn't take anything from you to celebrate another man. Not at all. But what happens, and I agree wholeheartedly what was said earlier, what happens as we tend to grow in God, we don't spend time to develop interpersonal relationships. And as a result, we live as islands. And we don't have people in our life close enough that we can have accounts and balances. This is why it's dangerous to be an independent church. It's dangerous to be independent because you have no accountability. And if everybody that's around you needs you, you can't be accountable to them. 
You know, I can tell where a whole lot of you brothers are going today without even going into prayer if we just look at your cell phone. The people in your cell phone will give us revelation where you're going. The folks that are connected to you will tell us where you're going. And some of you need an anointing to delete a few people. <laughs> so what happens? He disguises himself and God allows Samuel to appear. And when Samuel appears to him, he says to him, why have you called me? You got your message when I was alive. Samuel said to Saul in verse 15, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I'm so distressed, uh, for the Philistines, have, have they make war against me, and, and God is departed from me, and answered me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Thou makest known, uh, therefore I have called thee, that thou makest known unto me what I should do. I am losing my mind because I don't have God, and I've got a job that I can't do by my own ability. And I need some direction. The scripture says, Samuel, therefore, in verse 16, then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord has departed from thee and has become your enemy? When God leaves you, it's a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous thing for God to leave you and then become your enemy. Nobody can pray for you. Nobody can intercede for you. Nobody can call deliverance on your behalf when God is your enemy. And here he is. So he's looking for some encouragement. And it's, 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 it's difficult. It's difficult when you get desperate to think objectively. Because most people that ask for criticism, they look for compliments. They really don't want the truth. I have a, a beautiful wife and some beautiful girls. Last time I stood before you, my girls were younger. And now one's on a master's program in accounting. And she's... Uh, the youngest one is in pre-med, and I remember now that my wife and I have an empty nest, we, 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 we know what to do. We don't say we don't know what to do. We know what to do. Yes, All right, you'll get that anyway. Uh, but she has asked me on different occasions how she looks, Mr. Porter. She asked me how she looks, and I know I have lied a couple times. I don't care what y'all say. I don't care what y'all say. Uh, I, I'm lying. I'm lying. I'm lying, but I'm not lying down alone. <laughs> How this look? Nice. You didn't even look. Nice. <laughs> Any liars in here today? Uh, don't don't don't, don't wimp out now, brother. Any liars in here today? I know you say you anointed liar, you. <laughs> Samuel tells him, because you obeyed not the voice of God, not only has the kingdom been ripped from you, but you and your sons will be with me tomorrow. In other words, he says, not only are you going to be defrocked, but you and your boys are going to die tomorrow, and you will be in death with me. Saul didn't want to hear it. But that was his word. The witch says to him, come on, King Saul, why don't you eat something? I know you're discouraged. He couldn't eat. He was, he was shaking and he fell sore. He fainted. But the next day in the battle, in the battle, his sons are murdered. Saul is stabbed. He tells his servant, kill me. Don't give them the liberty to abuse me. And his servant wouldn't do it. And, and Saul fell on his own sword and his servant killed himself. And the Philistines still came, took his body, cut his head off, and humiliated his body. All this happens when you don't have relationship with God while you're up. It's, a, it's, it's, it's foolish to believe Men fall when they're weak. You don't really fall when you're weak. When you're weak, you struggle. And anybody that's ever struggled 
you know that's a sign that you're saved. Because when you don't struggle, you just do it. Struggling is indicative that there's been a change in your life. Am I talking to anybody here? And as much as we love God, we have still uh, have to recognize we are flawed. What makes me up? Strength, power, intelligence, cowardice, ignorance, shame. That's what makes me who I am. And the reason I'm delivered from your opinion is because I can tell God on me and I don't have to wait for you to tell on me. I know me so well that I can tell on myself. And my judgment then is tempered because when I see my brother who's overtaken in a fault, there go I, but by the grace of God. So I cannot get lost in the applause and abandon responsibility. That's why it's, I'm praying for evangelists and people that travel because the applause can pervert your perception. People can celebrate you to a point that you lose responsibility to live. You not only got to have spiritual piety, but you got to have academic discipline that you've got to feed yourself first before you feed other people. It's dangerous only to study to preach, but don't study to eat. Sometimes you got to do some stuff for you. And if the only conversations you need is a bunch of cronies, a bunch of emasculated men, no power, no, no intestinal fortitude that can tell you, I love you, man, but you're wrong. And you want people who celebrate you and, 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 and lift you up around you. You are going through a psychosis with your crazy self. conversations of a lost mind. What if I only pray because it's my turn? Who's doing the prayer, Doc? Who doing the prayer, Doc? Well, I'm going to go ahead and pray. You don't pray privately. And if you don't pray privately, you'll get no public display. Now, let me help you. The scripture says, if a brother be overtaken in a fault, not everybody, but ye which are spiritual. My Buffalo brothers, thank God for you preachers, love you. Uh, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. That word meekness in Greek means without judgment. There's nothing worse than going through something and somebody ask you, well, why did you do that? If I knew, if I had cognitive reality working at the time, I would have not done it. <laughs> Look at somebody and say, don't interrogate me. So you know what we do when we fall? We take sabbaticals from church until we get ourselves together. That's a trick. That's a trick because we're so driven to project an image. So I'm going to stay away from you all until I get myself together. But the problem with staying away from people, it gives you an isolated perspective. And only you can see you. But you got to have other people in your life to give you a different perspective to see, yeah, you off, but God's hand is still on your life. It's amazing to me and our drive to be, Dr. Amos, theological, our theodicy hurts us. Your theodicy is when you try to figure out how can God be all good and evil at the same time. Nobody said that God was evil. But what happens by our choices, we assume every choice we made that's wrong, the devil it was the devil. The devil didn't give you the, 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 the credit card to, to get the room. Come on, amen. Come on, cough that amen. The devil 
The devil, the devil, the devil trick. No, that wasn't the devil. That was you. And the reason you can be delivered, you're trying to blame it on somebody who's not in the scene. Conversations of a lost mind. Saul did not pray. He had no private devotion. But he had public adoration. But when the lights went out, he was psychotic. He was insane. How do we get to this place? I've been places and I... I, I, I seen a lot of people and, and one thing that bothers me when I talk to people who are pseudo spiritual fake every other word pray the Lord hallelujah pray the Lord hallelujah I pray hallelujah we on the golf course <laughs> see something's wrong with that He's spiritual. No, he's insane. He's psychotic. We on the golf course. Thank you, Jesus. God had nothing to do with you on the sixth stroke on a par four. <laughs> Ooh, y'all look mad and hungry. Let me hurry. Let's, let's go to the juxtaposition of Daniel chapter 2. Now remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, he says the weapons of our warfare, brethren, are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. How can you use this spiritual warfare and there's no demon here? Uh, how can you, ooh, how can you use this scripture for your spiritual warfare and there's no devil here? He says, casting down imaginations. I got to put in check what's going on in my mind. And bringing every thought into captivity. We got to deal with the mindset here. But if we keep saying it was the devil, it was the devil. Now granted, he does exist. But when, when granddaddy died, the devil didn't kill him. It was pork chops, fat back, chitlins, too much. Say, all right, y'all, okay, okay. See, so it becomes a mindset. He says in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, the weapons of our warfare are not caught up by mighty through God that are pulling down strongholds, casting down imaginations, and bringing every thought into captivity and obedience of Christ. So I've got to deal with my own thought life. Now, an experience is based on a web of facts and feelings. That's how you have an experience. The ingredients of an experience is a web of facts and feelings. Now, pending on the facts and pending on the feelings, it will determine what kind of experience you have. There are some women who think that you are uh, 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 the guy she wants to marry and everybody is telling you man that's a good woman to marry and that's a fact she is a good woman but the problem is you ain't feeling her so you need to marry her and that's a good woman and you're absolutely right that's a fact but I don't get goo goo ga ga when I look at her oh uh, god and so if you impute on me your facts and I don't have the right feeling, we're going to have a bad experience. And contradistinctively, if they tell her, that's a good man, you ought to settle for that. And if a man pulls out a wad of money, he's broke. That's all he carried in his pocket. I, I got money. He's broke. Because you got real money in rabbi trust, stocks, bonds, and annuities. <laughs> Ooh, I felt a cold spirit right there. All right. 
Let's go to Daniel chapter 3. If you're receiving this, brothers, shout, I'm receiving this. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is the king in Daniel chapter 2, and he is a God-man. He has been raised to believe he is a God. Now, a lot of his perversion and his character is based on the way he was raised. He was not raised as an ordinary child. As a matter of fact, Saddam Hussein, who was the leader of the Ba'ath Party, was raised the same way. The biography of his life says he was raised to believe that he was the incarnation of Nebuchadnezzar. That when he would grow up, he would be Nebuchadnezzar and men would bow down to him. Nebuchadnezzar was raised to be egomaniacal. It was all about Nebuchadnezzar. And what happens to him, he has only around him people who celebrate him but don't sharpen him. And one night, for a season, according to scholars, six months to a year, he's troubled in his sleep. His dreams trouble him. And he can't find anybody to interpret his dreams. And so while he's troubled in his sleep, he calls for the Chaldeans and, and the soothsayers and says, somebody come and tell me my dream. He says, well, we can't tell you your dream, but if you tell us what it is, O king, we, we'll interpret it. He said, no, I, I, don't, I want you to tell me what I dreamt and interpret it. I mean, this, the deck is stacked. He said, king, no man can tell you what your dream was. But we will interpret it. There is no man that can do that. Now, I don't want to get into mysticism and challenge some people that practice mysticism in Pentecostalism. Uh, but if you don't have pragmatism with your mysticism, you're practicing witchcraft. You can't say the Lord, 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 and have no scripture to back up all this stuff you keep saying. And so what happens here, Daniel happens to be in this area and Nebuchadnezzar says, I want somebody to interpret my dreams. Now people have made a living off of interpreting dreams in 2011. And every dream you have is not godly inspired and not demonically influenced. The Bible says by the multitude of business, dreams come which means you can have something on your mind and be preoccupied with something all day that inevitably you'll dream about it that night. But here, he says, I want you to interpret my dream. Tell me what I dreamt and tell me what it means. We can't find anybody. So he said, there's a guy, there's a guy, there's a guy, there's a guy, uh, Daniel, he, he, he can do it. Daniel interprets his dream, but because Nebuchadnezzar is psychotic, he thinks it's all about him. Have you ever talked to men who tell you all about them and never inquire about what you got going on? Never ask about your wife or your family? <laughs> It'll get better in a minute. Just hold on. Because we got to deal with the mind. Nebuchadnezzar has Daniel and the three Hebrew teenagers in his camp, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And after Daniel interprets the dream, they get promoted. But Nebuchadnezzar forgets because he too has no private devotion, no private worship. And they put out a decree and said, listen, we don't want Daniel and the Hebrew boys having favor. And it's difficult when people don't like you, but they need you. And you got to let God use you when people don't even like you. They pass a decree, and the decree says, at the sound of the sackbut, the dulcimer, the harp, the timbrel, I want all the governors and the rulers of the providence and the princes to bow down and worship this image that I have made of myself. Well, when Shadrach... Meshach and Abednego and Daniel would not bow. One ends up in a den of lions and the other's in a fiery furnace. But Nebuchadnezzar has reservations. 
And he asked, is it well with you, Daniel? Is it well with you? He said, it's well with me. Daniel's delivered. You know the story. Hebrew boys have a fourth one in the furnace. They have delivered. But here is the kicker. By the time you get to chapter 4, Daniel interprets one more vision. Now, I understand what it means to be a godly man, biblically. I see the template, and I'm trying to be the best man I can be. It's got to be God first, your family, then church. And church cannot be your wife. And your family should not be a casualty of the war and your devotion to church. Here we go. Daniel chapter 4. The Bible says in verse 28, And all that came unto the king Nebuchadnezzar at the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of my kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? He is consumed with his self. He's measuring himself by his statue, by his accomplishments, by his home, by his, 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 his investments. He's measuring himself by this. Now, this man is afflicted. And according to James 5, in context, when he says, any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. Any afflicted, let him pray. The affliction in James 5 is not physical damage or physical bodily pain. It's psychological. How? Because the scripture says, any sick, let him call for the elders. If you're afflicted, you should pray. So it means you can have something on your mind, but it will not inhibit you from talking to God. My mother-in-law has the fourth stage of Alzheimer's. And she was a missionary in the Church of God in Christ. And now she cannot talk. And she played the piano. And we would go to the nursing home to see her. And she just mumbles. But if we say anything about Jesus, Jesus touches her parasympathetic nerve. That part of her that belongs to God no matter what. If we start singing, yes, Jesus loves me, her hand goes up. If we say the name, she shakes her head. Doesn't matter how lost you may be in your mind. If you had any kind of experience with the name. Oh, God. We would say, Jesus Gummy, we call the gummy missionary. Jesus. She said, hey. Because there are places where only he can reach. And that's why we have to stop judging each other, brothers, on a moment. If I've, if I've fallen, I'm not lame. I've just failed. And we do have some issues to deal with. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Preachers, sit down, please. Well, this is what he says. Verse 31 of Daniel chapter 4. If you have it, say amen. Let's read it in concert. Ready? Read. Old Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, I heard about 20 of us. That's pitiful. Let's try it again. Now, all this time, God has not spoken to Nebuchadnezzar. He has never heard from God. But when he decides he wants to be God, God says, all right, let me show you how it is up here. And God says to him, Nebuchadnezzar, 
The kingdom is departed from you. And they shall drive thee from men. Watch now. And thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. Seven times shall pass over thee till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth to whomsoever he will. The same hour, verse 33 was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar and he was driven, he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird claws. And at the end of the days of I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes unto heaven and my understanding returned unto me and I blessed the Most High and I prayed and honored him that liveth forever whose dominion is everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. How did you know that when you were out of your mind, Nebuchadnezzar? What happened in the conversation of a lost mind? He has a disease. The disease is called boanthropy. Boanthropy is when you psychotically believe you are a cow or an ox. Okay, let me help you with this. A werewolf, lycanthropy, you think you are a wolf, but you're not a wolf. You may act like a dog, but you're not a dog. But this situation, God has touched Nebuchadnezzar and he has lost his mind. He's out of his mind, but God is not out of his mind. Oh, I wish I could preach this like I feel it. He is out of his mind, but God is not out of his mind. That's why you don't never know who God is going to redeem, whom God is going to give another chance. Some of us are past the second chance. We're just riding on another. You don't know who God is going to raise up while we write them off. God is saying, I'm here with you in the dark, but it's not your time to manifest. It's not your time to come forth. We're going to have a conversation in this lost place in your mind. Nebuchadnezzar says, as I close, Nebuchadnezzar says, while I'm out of my mind, eating grass like an ox, Bishop Sheet, eating grass like an ox, feathers growing out, my nails, like eagle's claw, I stink. They're writing me off. Now, God finds me. And I'm eating grass in the field. I have no company, but I talk to myself. And your best conversation is with you. Nobody can take you to God like you can take yourself. We'll bring you on a G-rated prayer, but you got some R-rated stuff going on in your life. You can talk to God about you. Nebuchadnezzar, I love what he says. I love what he says. He says this. He says, he says in verse 84, I, Nebuchadnezzar, thank you, Jesus, lifted up my eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned. I looked up, God said, I've been waiting for you to look up for seven years. Your problem, you became, you moved from your id, which is part of your ego, which helps you understand your super ego. What do you mean? Your id is what a baby has. You don't care about other people. You just want to get yourself satisfied. When you, write, when you live off your id, you are immature. You don't care who it hurts. You don't care who's hurt by it. You just want to get what you want. That's called the id of your psyche. But then you have what's called the ego. The ego is what makes you get out of bed and go to work. Not because you love the job but you got responsibilities and so I need my ego to roll me up out of the bed I don't care how long I was up last night my ego has got to shake me and tell me get up and go to work but then my super ego that's what says not only go to work but make something bigger than a nine to five start your own business and then you're driven by your super ego 
Well, what happened to Nebuchadnezzar? His id heard his ego talking. What do you mean? He had been living for himself. And finally, he says to himself, you better change your perspective and look up. And when he looked up, he saw something in this lost place that he never seen before. He saw that God was bigger than his super ego, than his ego, than his id, than his persona, than his ambitions, than his aspirations, than his desires. God was bigger. And anytime you get discouraged, change your perspective. Watch what he says. The Bible says, he says, my logic, my reasoning returned, and I blessed the Most High. Now, he hadn't been to Sunday school. Wait a minute now. You hadn't been to the crusade. He hadn't spent any time with God. In other words, it's logical, man, for you to be a worshiper. It's logical for you to have a relationship with God. When his reasoning came back to him, he began to worship God. You really don't need a worship symposium. All you need is an experience. And if you have an experience with God, you don't need an usher. You don't need a choir member. You don't need a praise team. If you have an experience with God, it will provoke you. Watch what he says. Now he's still talking to himself. How could you say that, Pastor Hennings? Because he's speaking in the first person. I, Nebuchadnezzar. Who are you talking to, Neb? He says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes under heaven and my understanding came back to me and I praised and honored him, the most high that liveth forever, whose dominion is everlasting. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. Now watch what he says. And all inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. Talk Nebuchadnezzar. And among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? Listen how this man is talking who's out of his mind. He has learned that God is in control. And when you think you're God, you're getting ready to mess up. He that humbles himself shall be exalted. He that exalts himself shall be made a base. Here we go. This is the clincher statement. He says in verse 36, at the same time, my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom and my honor and brightness returned unto me and my counselors and my Lord sought unto me and I was established in my kingdom. Now you got to understand, he just went into a, a dis, dissertation here because he has been out of his mind for years, but he finds God in the field. Sometimes you can't find God in comfortable environments. But he finds God in the field, and when he gets his reasoning back, the Bible lets you see that his servants come to him. He looks like an ox. He's funky. He stinks. But he's still their leader. And what brings them back to him is that he recognizes it's not me who's in charge, but it's God. And when they see that he is a worshiper, when they see he's a worshiper and he's giving something glory that's bigger than him, then they come to him. Last verse. The scripture says, now I never... I'm sorry, I'm getting happy by myself. Last verse. He says, now I, he's declaring it to himself. You got to sometimes stand in your bathroom, Simmons, and talk to yourself while you're standing in there in your underwear. You haven't even brushed your teeth, but preach to yourself, minister to yourself, talk to your mind, change your perception, change your look. Tell somebody, I got to talk to me. Last verse. No, don't worry. Don't worry. You don't have no work to do, Harley. 
Verse 37, let's read it together. Ready, read. Okay, let me read it for you because I heard y'all, uh, pride, uh, the heaven. Uh. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, I praise and extol and honor the king of heaven whose works are true and his ways judgment and those that walk, now listen, he says, and those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. What's the moral of the message? The moral of the message is you can be in a situation, sitting in a lost place, having a conversation with yourself. And right here, while you're in this situation, bills are overdue, marriage is volatile, children bringing home D's and F's telling you F is for fantastic and D is for dandy. You know, just things are crazy. And, 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 and you don't know what to do, and, and, and you have shifted because your back surgery has been seven years ago, and you still have Loratab left over, and now you have shifted the Loratab from being a pain medication to being psychotropic. It's dealing with your mind. I don't know what he's talking about. Oxycontin, NyQuil, and your call has been over for six weeks, but you're still drinking NyQuil. Something is wrong with your mind. But in the midst of it, in the midst of it, in the midst of a lost mind, I got to have a conversation. I got to have a conversation. What is the conversation? He said, if you're afflicted, let him pray. I can talk to God while I got all this hell going on. I can still talk to God. And once I talk to him, he'll make you start praising the scripture says, he said, I will praise thee. Nobody taught him how to praise God. But praise will bring your mind back. Praise will bring your mind back. When you're about to lose it. When you're about to have a nervous breakdown. When you're about to do something crazy. Lift your hand. Open your mouth. And give God glory. And praise. Will bring your mind back. I don't believe it. Ask David. David said. While he was messed up with thorns and thistles and grass and his hair is matted and he came across a group of people that were in debt and greatly distressed and they thought he was just like them but David said I've been through the same thing you've been through and I know how you feel but I had a conversation in my lost mind and since God has dealt with me even though I look bad he said I will bless the Lord at all times And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Then he says this. He says, the humble, hurting people, men who are fragile, things are on the, nerve, on the edge of breaking, the humble shall hear thereof. You missed it. He's saying, the humble, the hurting men shall hear my praise and be glad. Because I look like an ox. I've been eating grass. But instead of me howling like a cow, they heard me in the field say, Hallelujah! And they see if I can give God glory and all I got going on, then surely. Conversation of a lost mind. Let's stand. Well, you're already standing, but let's stand. Listen. Listen, brothers. Listen. The conflict is not always demonic. Sometimes the conflict is psychological. Sometimes it's emotional. People want you to be grateful for what you got going on. If I had your hand, I'd be praising God. But they don't understand 
there's more to you than what they see. That's why you can't judge my trial. You don't, you don't know what proclivity I struggle with. You don't know. Even though I have a job and I got a home, I got